Next session, which is going to take us to a break, um, another critical one. Maybe this first discussion is going to be redundant in a few minutes because we're talking about uh, driverless cars, that whole evolution of, techni of technology. Science fiction that's just a plaything for some clever technologists, or is it going to actually be a transformational technology, social and technological revolution? We've got a lineup of five speakers to offer us some perspectives on that. Delighted, first of all, to welcome to the plat platform Dan Daniela Rus, um, who's from MIT, from the CSAIL, uh, from the lab here. Uh, done a lot of work in this area, Daniela, so be fascinated to hear uh, what your take on this issue is. Okay, welcome. thank you. So I used to live in New Hampshire, where my commute to work was uh, about five minutes at any time of the day. And uh, today, when I moved to Boston, my commute to work is 20 minutes on Sundays and 40 to 80 minutes uh, during the week. Today, it was 40 minutes. I was lucky. Uh, but this, is, this was unacceptable to me, so I became interested in transportation. And in fact, um, the hours of time we spend in traffic has been going up um, steadily, and, uh, and, and it's up for every um, city type. So this shows um, small, medium, large, and very large cities, and how many hours of delay congestion um, causes. Uh, this costs us a lot of money, uh, not just in the amount of time and our psychological well-being when we are stuck in traffic, but also on the fuel wasted, on the impact uh, um, uh, to the environment. And uh, here you can see a study where um, the cost of congestion was uh, quantified in dollars um, for two cities, Boston and Houston. It turns out we spent about 34 hours, extra hours, um, um, just commuting due to com uh, congestion. So what can we do? So um, my uh, great aspiration and, uh, and dream is to do data-driven mobility on demand with self-driving cars, to connect people's needs with public transportation and with IT technologies, to collect a lot of data about where people are, where people are going, and this data can come from phones, from road cameras, from uh, satellite TV, uh, from, from satellites, from um, uh, Wi-Fi nodes, uh, from all sorts of different data sources that we have available uh, today, um, to take this data, to put it all in the cloud, and then to use this data as a way of forecasting congestion, as a way of knowing where the people are and focusing uh, where the vehicles are, where the transportation is, how we shape the, uh, the public transportation routes, um, and things like that. Okay, so what can we do with the data? Um, this is uh, data from a study we have done in the city of Singapore where um, um, most people travel by public transportation and by an inexpensive um, uh, ride offered by a fleet of 26,000 cars. Um, in fact, we were just talking about that in the earlier session. Anyway, you can see that we can see exactly where the people are at uh, any time of the day. Uh, we can also um, take information about where people are. We can take information about the current uh, road congestion, and we can compute how much time does it take you to go from uh, one point to another at different times of the day. And we can suggest people um, times when they might um, shift their driving if they're flexible. Okay, so we have data. We can get a lot of information about where people are and what we need from the data. But we also need uh, vehicles to deliver on this aspiration of self-driving cars. And um, we already have vehicles that we use in ride-sharing systems, and we talked uh, during the previous hour about them. So the bikes. But the problem with the bikes um, is that um, while they are uh, present, while they are available for anyone to use, uh, they are available at fixed locations. And uh, in general, people tend to go to the same places. As you can see in the little chart from the Singapore traffic, in the morning, the traffic is focused uh, in the downtown area and at the airport in Singapore. But the country is much bigger. And this, is, uh, this study actually generalizes to other places. 
So what can we do? People tend to go to the same places, then uh, cities have to hire trucks to rebalance uh, the bikes. But if the bikes could drive themselves, or if the, cars, uh, if the bikes could become robot cars that could drive themselves, and if these cars knew exactly where the people were and where the demand for the transportation was, they could drive themselves optimally to the next person in the queue waiting to be delivered um, somewhere. So that is the aspiration of uh, mobility on demand. You know where the people are, and the vehicles can drive themselves, the vehicles can talk to each other, they can talk to the cars, and they can figure out the best um, way for, um, um, for delivering people. This chart shows two different robots, so keep that picture in mind. Um, the first robot was um, with the MIT urban uh, challenge car um, that was developed for the DARPA urban challenge. Uh, it was a um, seven hour drive of, uh, of robot cars in traffic. So uh, that car had a half a million dollars worth of sensors on it, uh, impractical. But in fact, the cost of delivering mobility and delivering self-driving cars has been decreasing systematically. And this is a fleet of inexpensive cars, golf cars and electric vehicles, uh, that we have developed um, in, um, for our Future of Urban Mobility project in Singapore. Now, this is not correct. Just push that. It just tells you because five well, I had, all right, so this is, um, that was probably three minutes. Okay, anyway, um, here is how the, here's what the robots um, look like. Uh, they have a whole suite of uh, inexpensive sensors. They have cameras and they have laser scanners. And with this, um, these robots can do a lot of things. Um, now, this is not playing, so it's a good thing I can um, click the button. So here you can see, um, you can see the robots and you can see how uh, uh, reliable, flexible they are, and you could see their capability. They know where they are on the roads. Um, they can... Um, now, what's happening here? So did I miscalculate how many slides I needed? I took 20 slides. Um, okay, so um, uh, they, can, they can detect pedestrians and um, they, can, uh, they can interact with pedestrians and with other cars. So I wanted to show you this because I think it's important for you to get a sense that in fact this is not just science fiction, it's happening, it's happening on the roads of Singapore, it's happening with the um, Google car, uh, it's happening uh, in uh, many parts of the world on experimental platforms Platforms, but we are ready to take um, this idea to the next big step. So, in other words, by connecting self-driving cars to people, to information technology, and to public transportation, we can achieve a much more efficient and um, uh, pleasant experience uh, going from commuting from uh, our homes to work or anywhere else we might go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Looking forward to opening up uh, the conversation uh, around some of those issues already identified. Our second contributor, uh, Nai Kao, is the Global Product Line Manager at TomTom. Tom. So trying to work out how we organise these systems and all the rest of it. Uh, I should think you're having great fun at the moment. So uh, welcome and I be interested to uh, hear some of the work that you're involved in in this arena. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity for uh, us to be here and talk about the role of maps in automated driving. Uh, just uh, quickly, a uh, summary of TomTom. Tom. We've been bringing innovation to navigation and um, transportation for over 20 years, brought out the uh, GPSs, TomTom Tom sports watches. Uh, and most recently, we've worked with Daimler in uh, bringing semi-autonomous um, navigation to their trucks. And then going forward in the future, we would also um, uh, be providing maps for a lot of uh, OEMs for their autonomous driving capabilities. Um, here's just a representative uh, picture of all the different companies that have um, talked about bringing autonomous um, vehicles to the road by 2020. And uh, many of these uh, manufacturers already have some kind of vehicles already on the road in um, test purposes. Uh, you know, uh, the drivers are driving down the road without any type of uh, interactions uh, whatsoever. Bill Ford has actually said that by the time uh, autonomous driving comes to the mass uh, market, you won't even um, uh, worry about it. Be, it'll be anticlimactic because you'll see all the features before. So here, 
uh, on the left, you have uh, this thing I took off of uh, Mini Cooper's uh, website. They basically use mapping data to uh, estimate when you're about to go into a tight curve, change the gears accordingly, um, improve safety, improve performance. Dymo does the same thing. They use map data to estimate when the trucks are going to see gradients on the road and then pre-shift the, uh, the trucks accordingly in order to optimize fuel. And they've been saving something about four to 6% for each of uh, their trucks that use this. Um, maps as they are currently uh, created aren't really good enough to um, put into autonomous vehicles. That's because they don't have the granularity, they don't have the accuracy. Um, what we really need are 3D uh, representations of the road. So it requires accuracy to be uh, within 20 centimeters. Um, it requires you to know exactly the number of lanes, what size the lanes are. And um, uh, you also need to have uh, essentially a planning map that allows you to know if you are in a particular lane, what kind of actions can you take with that particular um, feature. So if your hands are off the wheel, the car needs to be able to know uh, where it's going and what its legal restrictions are. So uh, those are the kind of challenges that we've been developing, the in entire industry has been developing. Um, Part of the challenge, though, is that you want to have a very, very good uh, map. You want to make sure that you uh, look at everything you create and you want to turn it around really quickly because <laughs> if someone is doing road construction, you don't want that car driving down that road to not know that that road construction is there. Uh, and you know, for us, being map makers, we know that roads change up to 15% a year. You might think that that's a huge number, but um, you know, this is sort of like the state flower of uh, Massachusetts and any other state you have. <laughs> um, so how do we get really good data? Well, we, along with all the other folks, uh, have these things called mobile mapping vans that can get really, really high accuracy information. But the problem is there aren't enough of these vehicles to drive all the roads every day. Um, and what do we do about that? Well, what we try to do is get active community input. And TomTom Tom over the years has worked with hundreds of millions of um, people in our community in order to get better data. The problem is that you know, sometimes in this particular case, somebody has tried to put a cat into the map. And for us, we don't want to try to do that. What we want to do is we want to have uh, sensor-derived information. Basically, this comes from the vehicles itself. As vehicles are equipped with better uh, sensors, we're able to capture better data and send it back to uh, create a better map. Um, the other thing we think really has to happen is that there has to be an open uh, ecosystem where people are sharing information with each other across platforms and speaking the same language. Automakers can't hoard the information to themselves anymore. Um, we don't think this is an acceptable use case for autonomous driving, so if your car is driving around, do not jump out of it. Um, but what I uh, would think um, highly automated driving and autonomous driving is, it's about safety, it's about efficiency, performance, and comfort. And those are the kind of things that's going to drive this industry, and we need people to um, be able to share the information in the cloud uh, and be able to turn things around really quickly. And I'm done, just in time. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Our next uh, contributor uh, to this conversation to offer us some thoughts is uh, Christian Zalberti, who's a researcher at the uh, NL Foundation and uh, doing lots of work around sustainability issues, energy, but also looking into the sphere of driverless cars. So uh, welcome on board and fascinating to hear uh, your perspective on this. Okay, so good morning to everyone. Uh, today I will speak about uh, some uh, sustainable urban mobility solutions. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, Enel Foundation is a non-profit entity funded by the Enel Group, uh, whose main activities uh, are in, in, in those thematic areas, so energy, socioeconomics, sustainable development, and innovation. And our uh, research activities uh, are implemented in close collaboration with the wide network of academies and uh, research institutes, among others, among the most prestigious, MIT. 
So this is just a brief overview of uh, the Enel Group, which is the second largest uh, utility in Europe by installed capacity. So I will start my presentation saying that the 21st century uh, will be the century of the cities. Uh, as you can see, by 2030, 41 mega cities are expected and 60% of world population is expected to be concentrated in those areas, posing a huge problem of sustainability. So here you can find some data, uh, which are taken from one of our more recent studies. Uh, if we compare the 10-year growth rate of uh, energy for transportation and population in some significant megacities, as you can see, for example, in uh, strong urbanization areas like China and Brazil, uh, a big increase in population uh, is reflected in a, a big need for energy for transportation, while in other areas, uh, even if the population increased, uh, we can register a decrease in energy for transportation due to efficient policies and in some other cases, strong measures for uh, reducing the use of cars in cities. So uh, transportation is centered in urban areas. As you know, the 22% of CO2 emissions comes from transportation and the 30% of that uh, is produced in urban areas. Uh, you can see uh, the main pollutants produced in transportation in Europe. Uh, as you can see, uh, transportation has a big impact on, uh, on the production of main pollutants. And uh, using techniques like, uh, like uh, source apportionment techniques, we can derive, for example, that the 65% of nitrogen dioxide is produced in urban areas, uh, causing uh, air pollution problems. Uh, actually, around 90% of Europeans living in cities uh, are exposed to levels of air pollutants which are considered uh, damaging to health by the World Health Organization guidelines. Uh, you can see some examples of uh, documents produce, uh, produced in Europe dealing with sustainability in, in urban transportation. Uh, in these documents, you can find uh, st uh, strategies uh, for efficient public transport services and uh, quantification of benefits of uh, urban services, like, for example, uh, collective task services. So I will highlight the role of these uh, three different uh, solutions for sustainable mobility. The first one is car sharing, uh, and obviously a big increase uh, in, the, in this kind of service may reduce the number of car, uh, or cars in the city, so reducing the, the, the emissions. Uh, while a big penetration of uh, electric vehicles uh, can uh, displace the local pollutants from urban areas and, in the and, and when the energy is produced by renewables, these pollutants and CO2 can be avoided. While autonomous vehicles uh, allowing the removal of traffic lights in city can make the traffic more fluid. So this is just a chat with uh, the growth of electric vehicle sales around the world. Uh, if this trend continues by, 20, by, by 2016, we will see more than one million electric vehicles on roads. So going to Italy, which could be considered a good uh, case study, uh, being one of the countries in the world with the highest number of vehicles per capita, and uh, uh, this is very interesting, the 70% of CO2 emissions is produced uh, for trips in the range of 50 kilometers, so mainly in urban areas. Uh, this is what, what's happening in, uh, in Italy. Uh, we are facing this uh, new uh, phenomenon of car sharing. Actually, in, in, in 2013, in Italy, more than 200,000 people registered to uh, these services. And if you go to Rome and Milan, you can find more than 2,000 vehicles available uh, in the street. Uh, what's happening with uh, electric vehicles in Italy? So uh, by 2020, the price of an electric vehicle is foreseen to be comparable to the price of a, uh, a, a traditional car. Uh, in, I'm finishing. Uh, by 2030, 10 million electric vehicles are foreseen to be circulated in Italy, uh, the 50% of them in the cities. So this is why Enel Foundation and the Enel Group in, in general uh, is interested in um, mobility and sustainable mobility in, in uh, uh, urban areas. And this is why uh, the Enel Foundation is collaborating with MIT Sensible City Lab in these two projects. The first one deals with uh, car taxi sharing and the second one deals with the impact of autonomous driving. Uh, in, in both projects, uh, quantitative evaluation of the benefits of 
a progressive switch from traditional to electric mobility will be carried out. So thank you for your attention. Here's my contact information. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Our next contributor, um, Paolo Santi, is a research scientist at the MIT Sensible City Lab, uh, where he leads the MIT uh, Fraunhofer Ambient Mo Mobility Initiative. Also very much involved, I think your key interest is in uh, modeling and an analysis of complex systems. So I should think this is quite an area for you. Yeah, it's so quite a complex system. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't begin to imagine. So uh, we'd be very interested to hear your take on this, uh, this area. Thank OK, you. thank you very much, Peter. I'll try to share you in these five minutes a little bit of possible uh, future visions about driverless cities. So first we start with some fact. I mean, uh, roads are being there for several years since when they are constructed. So whatever road we build now is gonna stay there for 30 years. And this is important to bear in mind because on the other end, we know that all these technologies we're talking about, communication technology, self-driving technology that is maturing very quickly, means that self-driving cars are becoming reality very soon. And there are predictions says that, saying that by here, to, I mean, basically in 20 years from now, most of the vehicles will be self-driving. And this means that the roads that are built now are going to witness the advent of self-driving vehicles. So it's now the right moment to start thinking about how the city will be with self-driving vehicles. And one of the main elements of car and city is traffic lights. Traffic lights have been invented more than 150 years ago in London, to be exact. And they were invented for horses. There weren't even cars there. And they were invented you know, because there was this need of regulating you know, intersecting flows of vehicles, in that case were carriages. Okay? And since then, the main concept of a traffic light hasn't changed. Despite the different advancement in technology, maybe now they are nicer, but the same idea is still there. So basically, you give access to right the intersection to flows of vehicle, either to direction, not to single vehicle. So now we are moving into a different reality where vehicles will be able to talk to each other, to talk with the environment, to self-drive. So the big question is, so the next system for regulating access to the intersection will be just an evolution of traffic light, just a smarter traffic light, or can we do something better, something that really brings a breakthrough? And so we have started asking ourselves this question, and we have we are not the first thinking about so-called smart intersections in which we give access to vehicles, not to flows. So the idea is to give a personalized a personalized green light to each individual vehicle, depending on the trajectory that the vehicle will follow. And this can potentially provide a breakthrough because you can have simultaneously accessing the intersection different vehicles whose trajectory do not conflict with each other. Okay? So what we are trying to do is trying to put together a way of really trying to understand whether the system is better than traffic light, not by means of simulation, but by means of a framework that allows us to incorporate parameters like safety, the geometry of intersection, the length of vehicles, the speed of vehicles, and all these kind of things. And what we came up with, we have also some video to share if you want, you go on the Sensible website. But what we discover is that by transitioning to a slot-based system, you can double the capacity, meaning that the, same, the very same intersection can serve as, ma as many as double the same vehicles as a traffic light. Not only that, but you can reduce delays because the vehicles will travel faster to the intersection. But thanks to the fact that they won't stop and go, which is very bad for emissions, you would also have reduced emissions. So it's like a win-win situation. You would travel faster to your destination and you would waste less fuel and emit less pollutant in the environment. Of course, there are still plenty of challenges. For instance, how to integrate pedestrians and bikes into this system, okay? I'm meaning here that I'm not saying that vehicles will, will not be able to interact with that, but if you think about an optimized system, pedestrians and bikes are moving at completely different speeds with respect to vehicles. So, how to integrate this into an optimized traffic system is not easy. We have to think about it. 
Another challenge is related to user acceptance, okay? So we know from surveys that people is quite reluctant to actually sit and relax as these guys are doing, you know, with the back uh, to the road. But people actually think that this technology is not safe. They think they are better drivers than computers. Maybe it's the case, but maybe not. So we have to convince them. And other challenges are related to the ownership model. Because self-driving, we think, will impact that very much. For instance, you can think of completely different kinds of cars, like family cars that you know, drive you in the morning to work, then they go back home by themselves and pick your kids to school or something like that. Also, you can think about urban fleet, corporate fleets, and so on and so forth. So you should also redesign the vehicles, maybe. And it, it, a last important question, who is liable in case of an accident? Of course, we all uh, hope that there will be, I'm doing. Okay, I'm done. Okay, so, but in case there are, there are accidents, who is gonna be liable for that? The virtual robot that is driving the car, maybe is not the right person, I don't know, I mean, the right thing, maybe. But, okay, in order to, challenge, uh, to, to sort of try to address all these, cha uh, all these challenges, we are trying to put together uh, a, a project trying to build the first uh, experiment in the real world of self-driving cars together with other groups at MIT, uh, Daniela's group, Emilio Frazzoli's group, and the government of Singapore. And you will hear something more about, along this line by the next speaker, I think. Thank you. Thank you okay, our final contribution in this round before uh, we open up the conversation. Uh, delighted that um, uh, we're joined this morning by uh, Shan Wee, who's the future division director of the Ministry of Transportation in the government of Singapore, connecting on projects with MIT. Uh, and it's great to have someone from a city authority who's grappling with some of the challenges of, could this be answers, questions, problems, or whatever. So fascinating to hear some of the work that you're involved in, and uh, welcome. I'm going to share with, I'll start off with uh, just building a bit of context. What you see here is a map of Singapore. Uh, it is a city state with about 700 uh, square kilometer, about three times the size of Boston, but packed with 5.5 million uh, residents. And so one of the issues uh, that we have is actually land constraints. Some of the key challenges uh, in transport we expect the populations to continue growing with the economy. Uh, as expected, there's a lot of uh, expectations from the commuters. And most importantly, we have a very tight land constraint. If you look at it, currently, we have 12% of the land used for roads. And we, continue, we cannot afford to continue to build roads, especially if you contrast it with 14% land use for housing. Some of our strategies, these are current strategies. We have monetary disincentives. We price the roads and we charge for the usage during peak hours. Uh, we introduce off-peak car schemes. And we also introduce certificate of entitlement. Basically, before you can buy a car, you need to get this certificate of entitlement, which costs uh, as much as the car here. We also have non-monetary disincentives, parkings, public comms on calls and so on. And we try to promote travel demands management in a way of free travel for commuters within the city during the pre-peak hours so that we can spread the load. We also have incentives such as uh, working with companies to see how we can roll out some incentives for the commuters to do flexi work hours. We roll out our land transport master plan, basically, we want to continue to build the infrastructure. We aim to double the rail network or mass rapid transit network in Singapore by 2030. We also introduce more buses. And these are some of our goals stated in the Land Transport Master Plan. This year, we also roll out smart mobility. Smart mobility in the form of uh, testing the driverless bus, predictive signals, and using smart uh, 
data-driven intelligent transport system, how we can increase the capacity. Vehicles talking to one another maybe in the future. Just to share, back in 2003, we started the world first fully automated rail system, our Northeast Line. And so that brought us to why we are keen to explore how autonomous vehicles can augment this. More importantly, is to continue to improve the mobility of our residents. When we look at autonomous vehicles, being a city-state with uh, not, you know, very little land, what we are promoting is actually not a one-to-one -one replacement. Uh, what we are looking at is really how autonomous vehicles can facilitate car sharing, how autonomous vehicles can, together with the public transport system, serve the people better. <coughs> so in August this year, we announced uh, the Committee of Autonomous Road Transport in Singapore, CARS in short, where we will look at how autonomous vehicles could be deployed in Singapore, together with all the associated challenges that is mentioned uh, by the previous speaker. One of the things that we ask ourselves is could we have a new town or retrofit a town whereby the current road is only the current road is built around active mobility, i.e. walking, cycling, and only served by autonomous vehicles within the town. And for inter-town mobility, one can use the public transport of rail and bus. We know that Technology is still evolving, and we know that we have to continue along with the uh, technology changes. So what we have done is we promote public texting, we work with smart, we have a phased approach in terms of regulation. We have just announced that we will allocate a, an area for public road testing of autonomous vehicles, and this is a roadmap for regulations. We also introduce initiatives we also introduced initiatives uh, where we work with our local institutions to study what are the applications of autonomous vehicles. I think the previous few speakers have mentioned about Smart in Singapore doing a lot of work on autonomous vehicles. And one of the things is also how we can promote public acceptance in the use of autonomous vehicles. This is my last slide, and we think that Singapore being a densely populated city, state uh, have much to offer, and actually we welcome uh, car manufacturers, suppliers, to come and test the autonomous vehicles in Singapore and how we can work with institutions to also test case the value proposition of autonomous vehicles deployment in cities. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, we've got about, um, we've just got about, just, uh, about 25 minutes before we will have a nice break for a cup of coffee and you can... Uh, sniff some fresh air and all the rest of it. Um, but I've got my panel here. There was just one question I'd like to ask before uh, uh, opening it up. Uh, Paolo, I think you said by 2030, 50% of, of, of our cars will be driverless. I just want a reaction from others. Is that, that, that's, that excites me, but it scares me. Is, that, is, he just, is he just dreaming? What's going on? Uh. So I can, uh, if I can jump yeah, in, Daniela. I think that's a very exciting um, uh, opportunity and possibility, and I don't think it's far-fetched. Uh, just remember that 50 years ago, a computer was as big as this room, and only one person at a time could use it. And today, computing is indispensable. So uh, technology is evolving um, very, very rapidly. And uh, we are already on the, uh, on the way to making our cars autonomous. Uh, we already have uh, elements of autonomy in our vehicles, and uh, this is uh, much more than 50%. Uh, in fact, there are also car manufacturers who are introducing increased autonomy um, in, uh, in our cars to provide mobility for the aging population. Uh, I believe uh, Mercedes has a car that is fully autonomous and th that has been developed um, uh, with the aging population in mind. So I'm very bullish. I think it's going to be faster than 20 years. Okay, I'll just take one comment from somebody else. Does anyone take a counter view or you're just, we're just hurtling towards the future here? 
Yeah, I, I just yeah, want to say, as Daniela was saying, that actually maybe it's a bit even could, you know, quite, could be fat, much faster than that, maybe. And also, I am quite curious to ask you why you say I'm scared. So why are you scared of a future of self-driving vehicles? Yeah. You shouldn't. I mean, so yeah. you're a good example of the challenge that I was mentioning in my talk. So people mm. is actually, you know, a little bit reluctant yeah. to this. I, re I represent the human race. Sorry about that. No, no, no. It's very good, actually. You're going to have to cope a, with me somehow. It's a very good contribution <laughs> to, the, to the discussion, I think. Uh, because it was very natural for you to say, I'm scared. Yeah. And, and this is the kind of reaction that, yeah. you know, it's I very I was quite scared, scared of the first computer as well. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still scared of them today. Yeah. yeah but, I, but, yeah. I think uh, it's somewhat natural to be scared of something that we think is going to be a while before it gets here. Right. But uh, I think Daniela made a very good point. Uh, a lot of the automakers out there have somewhat autonomous capabilities right now. And to be honest with you, I think 90 plus percent of the car accidents that happen today happen because humans are making errors and not necessarily machines. So you should be scared of the cars that actually have people behind them. Okay. And can I, I, should, can yeah. I make one comment? On so uh, I think we're scared of the things we don't know, but once we get used to them, then we're no longer scared. And in fact, uh, my dream is to make robots <laughs> as common as phones so that we are, right. uh, we just take them as part of the ecosystem. And the anecdote I wanted to share is that um, our driverless cars have been um, roaming around the National University of Singapore campus uh, for several years now. And people, the student, they, they are on the same paths with the students and um, they have these big scary signs that say self-driving cars danger. And uh, does that scare our students? Uh, well, no. Uh, in, the, in the recent past, the students are actually almost annoyed by the cars and they are in front of the cars trying to make their way right. okay. forward. And, and the fact that I like driving, I've, I've just got to break the habit. It's like smoking, <laughs> is it, and, and, and drinking. I've just got to stop enjoying driving. I've just got to be... I've got to do something else. No, well, you can still drive. Okay, but you, a, have, you could still drive, pretend, but you have... A, no, no, you can have... You can imagine a car that you could drive yourself or you could tell it to drive itself. <laughs> okay, there's, there's a number of tweets come in, and I'm just, I'll start to get the hands, but there's quite a number of tweets coming. Just, just trying to get our next round this transition phase. It, it, there's a kind of feeling that it's an all-or-nothing world, and, and uh, the cost... Or, or, or the complexity of trying to have a transitional hybrid of kind of half and half. We can, we can see it for dedicated routes, I don't know, from the airport to the something or other. But, but is anyone getting their brain around what transition looks like? You know, zero to 100% at some point, it feels like a going to be a, an almost impossible mess. Does anyone just want to offer me a... Well, well, I think I, uh, I think from a Singapore perspective, uh, the transition is unlikely to be all or nothing. Uh, it is likely to be one of uh, various pilots uh, or testings. And how we like to look at this issue is, uh, can we develop as the technology develops? And how we are thinking of doing is, uh, maybe we can look at uh, first of all, a controlled environment, and uh, it could be a slow-moving vehicle in a slightly more complex environment, right. or it could be a faster-moving vehicle, autonomous vehicles, but in a more controlled or simpler environment. And that is very important to us because we feel that public acceptance is one key area that we have to tackle if autonomous vehicles right. is to be deployed in a densely populated city like Singapore. And so we cannot afford to have that quantum leap without having to manage uh, what the residents may feel. Right, okay. Yeah. May I add a detail? So uh, maybe in, the, in, this, uh, in this intermediate phase, uh, the first step to reach will be uh, the, the public transportation. So autonomous vehicles in for, for public transportation. Right. That will be the first phase, and yeah. uh, as you as you said, uh, I, I see as a second stage uh, some uh, uh, some pilots in which, for example, in big areas with a, 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 a big uh, urbanization development, uh, maybe near to big cities, 
uh, using some uh, some blocks or some some parts of of the city to test the autonomous driving vehicles uh, right. for 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 private use as well. So where there's a will, there's a way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to open it straight open to to questions. Uh, lady right in the centre there, and then a lady towards the front. And just say who you are and where you're from. It's uh, helpful. My name is Ayako Maruyama. I'm from the Design Studio for Social Intervention based in Roxbury. Thank you, panelists, for an ex excellent presentations and just beautiful diversity of angles. Um, what excites me about this, I'm curious to know, what, how, how do you think driverless cars will shape our destinations? You've spoken about congestion and all, you know, our, our and, and, you know, Mr. Sean, you know, the limit limit of space and, and that's sort of our design challenge there is just this limitation and going into downtown. In the same way that highway is really shaped how we suburbanize and spread out, how do you see driverless cities change our destinations? Will we decentralize and does it even matter if you know majority of the earth will be urban in that point? So if you could please share, okay. thank you. I won't take a comment from anyone, uh, from everyone, but if there's just a couple of responses to that, who would like to uh, uh, panel? Yeah, I think, I mean, the question is actually very interesting. Uh, my take is that, in general, I mean, if you think of about um, a more optimized system, you would arrive faster to, from source to destination. And this means that, since there are, for instance, evidence saying that people for commuting is willing to, you know, devote a certain time budget, means this maybe means that you can have you know uh, either you reduce this time budget so you, you will arrive faster at the current destination or you can actually live farther away i mean that's a choice that we don't really know what people will do we cannot control that it's definitely something that we will see i mean uh, what we can say uh, what i what, what i can feel is that for sure self-driving vehicles give opportunity to have a much better and optimized traffic system okay how we make use of that or how people react to this is something that is not easy to predict now, I think. Right. Does anyone else want to? So I can add to that that I, I believe that driverless cars would make uh, things easier for us, would make it easier for us to get to our destination. So for instance, uh, with a well-verified uh, and um, a secure network of driverless cars, I don't need a nanny. I can have the car, um, I can have the robot come and deliver my kids to all the after-school activities, and uh, that would um, uh, that would uh, give me a lot of extra time. Well, if, if I could add uh, yeah. to that, uh, I think from our perspective, we are mindful that uh, autonomous vehicles deployment could go uh, either way. Uh, one model could well be a fully private own autonomous vehicles, where they just replace their current vehicle with autonomous vehicles. And we think that one will then make full use of it by sending, maybe currently, uh, the, the wife is taking a public transport, their children are taking public transport. But with autonomous vehicles, it adds on a lot more road trips. And in a city-state land constraint Singapore, we can ill afford that. And so that is one direction that we are mindful uh, we as a country cannot afford. So back to your questions in terms of the design, our one likely uh, possible deployment mode could well be how it can be shared and how it can supplement the current public transport network. Mm, a fascinating question. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a lady just here. Hi, my name is Michelle Sohn, and I'm a student at Harvard Law. Please don't hold that against me. Um, You're most welcome. <laughs> um, my question is about the potential of driverless cars contributing data to not only improve navigation, but to improve surveillance. And so I was wondering what your thoughts are on the privacy implications um, uh, on the subject. Thank you. Who would like to offer a comment on that? Whose areas of expertise? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I can Daniela. jump in and say that's that good. privacy is important. Yeah. And in fact, privacy is important for any application that uses data, not just transportation. The computer science field is developing techniques to, um, to ensure and guarantee 
privacy in, um, uh, in uh, the data that people contribute for the greater good. And we can go into details about what these technologies are. But I really believe that this is an area where computer science can really solve the problem. Anyone have a counter view? I completely agree with you. <laughs> yeah. this. You speak on behalf of the yeah. panel. Yeah. Reasonable? Yeah, okay. Uh, there, was a, there was a gentleman second row back there, yeah. Um, how, how are we going to ensure that cities with networks of self-driving cars are cities that people and pedestrians want to actually live in? Okay, and you are? I'm, I'm Dan Winston. I'm with uh, Transdev. Okay, and sorry, and just behind your question, you think people, no, no, not you. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you think that... So I, what I mean is, uh, I think of the movie Minority Report, I don't know if anyone's seen it, uh, where there's these self-driving vehicles, they're really quite scary. Uh, and I'm worried that if we optimize traffic networks and we create cities around self-driving cars, we will repeat some of the same mistakes we made where we created cities around regular cars. Yeah. They're not always great cities. What? I, yeah. No. I'd like to um, maybe address a certain portion of that. In, um, you know, our view, we work with a lot of uh, the OEMs, and I, I don't think that cities are going to be built around the way that technology is going to be implemented within vehicles, right? Um, it's, it's more about um, the vehicles having uh, the capabilities to help you with your commute to address uh, uh, her question earlier. It's not about if you're changing your destination from A to B, it's about uh, making your commute easier and safer, right? So if you take that 90 plus percent of the uh, human error uh, out of driving away, you know, you're not going to have someone uh, uh, worried about driving and texting at the same time. I think most of us who drive, even though we're not supposed to do it and we say we don't do it, we probably text at some point while we drive. So, but uh, I, I don't know if that sort of answers your question, but I, I think that the, the infrastructure itself will not change dramatically to accommodate uh, driverless cars. I think the automotive manufacturers are building the, um, the richness and the intelligence into the vehicles to prevent the kind of things that we, you and I, you know, anyone who drives every day runs into, whether it's blind spots from the sun, whether it's, whether, uh, whether it's uh, you know, a crying baby in the back, whatever that is, the distractions that happen to us that cause us to make errors when we're driving, I think that's going to be taken away. Mm -hmm. So the human-robot uh, interaction community is thinking very seriously about this question, uh, which is very important. It's very important for transportation and for any other application where robots and humans are, uh, coexist and um, uh, are supposed to work together. And uh, it's very interesting because um, uh, the issues are, well, how do you design machines so they are attractive and you want to be engaged with? But also, how do you, as human, engage with a machine? Uh, can we get the machines to talk to us in natural language? Uh, this is important because otherwise the machines are only usable by experts. Uh, can you get the machines to be able to introspect and give people feedback on what they're doing, where they are, um, uh, how things are evolving in the task so that people get uh, confident that they are actually in a safe environment. So these are still open research questions, but the community is addressing them. Mm. Okay. Uh, gentleman in the, in the blue there, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amir. I'm coming from North Eastern. Um, based on your talk, uh, I'm curious, how do you see the bike car communication or pedestrian car communication in the future? What's the current stage? What's the future? And what's the problems that you see that happening? Um, I, can tell, I, I see no problem in communication. I mean, we already have, uh, everybody has a smartphone. I mean, definitely we will have by in 20 years from now. So I, it's, it's a, I mean, the point that I see is the following. I, I'm not very much concerned of the interaction of the, you know, sensing at interaction between vehicles and pedestrians and bikes. This is something that, you know, as uh, the video that Daniela showed is already being done. So I don't think that's going to be a big problem. It's more like, and it, as I was saying, that if you think about a system 
in which you want to optimize how many vehicles flow to an intersection because you want to reduce congestion, you want to have a more efficient transportation. The speed of vehicles is different from the speed of pedestrian and the speed of bikes. And this is a fact, okay? So a question is, do I want to slow down the flow of vehicles for, I don't know, allowing a pedestrian to cross the intersection, as this is the currently, you know, way of approaching the problem with traffic lights? Or you want to have separate flows for pedestrian bikes and vehicles? This is a design question, okay? So the technology allows you to do whatever you want. It's, you can think about, you know, if you think about a slot-based system, a vehicle or a pedestrian or a bike are the same thing. You, all of them request a slot to cross the intersection. The difference is that the vehicle can travel at 50 kilometers per hour, the bike at 20, and the pedestrian at three. So, I mean, and this means that if you wanna give access to the intersection to a pedestrian, you have to slow down vehicles for 30 seconds, one minute. So these are the kind of questions we, we should try to address. It okay. can be a different solution, for instance, for suburban sub areas where there is less traffic, Mm -hmm. or different for you know, high, highly dense uh, traffic conditions in which you wanna have a clear separation between flow of bikes, vehicles, and pedestrians. Okay, I'm gonna go further back to the gentleman behind with the pullover, or whatever it is, yes. please. Yes. I believe, and it will be. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Jeff Rosenblum. I'm an engineer, but I'm studying in the urban planning department here at MIT. So when I think about these issues, I think the key thing is even though we're talking about technology, I think only 10% of the issue is really technology and 90% of it really comes down to policy. And talking about the issues of getting the cars to work, I mean, I'm an engineer, I believe we can do it. When it comes to the social systems to make a city that actually functions the way we want a city to function, I believe that's the part where we need a whole other set of conversations. So if we say we want cities that are walkable and bikeable where people are running into each other and we have a lot of open space, I feel like part of the issue with the conversation is if we triple the amount of biking and walking and we triple the amount of public space, what it means is we're gonna to want to make a third, just to make round numbers, of the amount of car throughput, which in some ways makes the autonomous vehicles a net zero, which I think is a positive thing for society, but I think when people in the autonomous vehicle world are talking about all of these social benefits of being able to reduce congestion, increase the amount of time that it gets there, it's pretty much relying on the assumption that you're making things efficient for cars. So I'm interested in how, how the messaging of this movement from a technology perspective is interacting with the policy movement of building cities that people want to live in. Big question, and I, I'd yeah. like a comment from a number of you. Can I start with so, you? Yeah. Well, well we, we are uh, very conscious that the technology uh, is likely to be just an enabler uh, in the quest to continue to increase the mobility of the resident. And so just now when I mentioned that uh, we have announced the setting up of a committee to look at how autonomous vehicles can be deployed in our city, or our country, uh, we are mindful of that, and that's why if you look at our committee construct, uh, we have included uh, people uh, who actually major in behavioral science and not quite the technologies kind of field. And we think that the, the communications have to start now. Although the technology is evolving and it's not quite ready for deployment, we have to socialize the idea of how we can use autonomous vehicles for the better of the country. And so that, that is one big aspect that we think is very crucial. So just now, I think you, you saw a video where uh, Smart deployed their driverless buggy uh, in a garden setting. The, the buggy, I think, is uh, traveling no more than 30 kilometers per hour. Uh, it's just over along a short stretch of road, or in fact, it's within a park. It is a very safe environment, but I think the joggers, the residents who make use of the park, get to interact with this notion of driverless. That's one. Second is uh, we are mindful that in our case, the deployment is likely to be a shared deployment. And so 
we are slowly ro rolling out car sharing concept in the first place. So we think that autonomous vehicles as an enabler will help to rebalance some of the car sharing issues that we face today. Uh, as you know, car sharing sometimes didn't quite work because the directional flow is in the morning peak hours, most people get to the city to work, and in the evening, most people drive out to their residential area, which is further apart. So it doesn't quite work when you have to walk to your car, retrieve the, the shared car, drive it all the way to the city, and, and stay there. So autonomous vehicles, if you look at it as an enabler, can rebalance that a lot more, and hopefully, that will increase capacity. Okay. I'm still interested in that challenge of, in a sense, it's, it's allowing a reinforcing of an addiction to our, our private or even slightly shared um, alumi aluminum or whatever it is vehicle that has a huge impact. I mean, I only have to walk around Boston to know what traffic is. It's a, a mess. Um, and I'm just interested as whether we are, we're just creating, a, you know, a, we're just perpetuating, um, you know, a, a problem. We're trying to make it slightly more efficient, but fundamentally, do we need to rethink how people get around cities? I think uh, that was a part of the part of the fundamental here. You know, we found another way of just make, squeezing it a bit more efficient. I believe, I mean, traffic light engineers are amazing. They've managed to squeeze that much more out of intersections, but maybe we should stop squeezing. We should, we should say, you know, sorry, obesity society, walking and cycling is great. And I'm just wondering whether there was a, there's a deeper challenge there to us, that there's a danger that, 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 that we sleepwalk. We don't, we don't even walk into a, into a techno world. Yeah. So, Paolo, no, no. and then I'll come please to you, uh, Daniela. No, I'm, no I'm, 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 I'm talking too much anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> now, I was saying that, I mean, we shouldn't think that, for instance, when I said earlier that in principle with this, smart intersection, you can double the capacity of the intersection. Don't mean that you have to squeeze twice as much through the same intersection, okay? That's a completely right. different story. What it means that you have a queue at the, at the intersection when you are operating close to capacity. So if you, if you double the capacity, you have less queues, okay? And then, you know, that's just a more efficient system. So how, how many vehicles you want to travel in your, system, in your city, how you want people to move in your city, is kind of a different story that you approach at, at a higher level, I think, you know, where, you see, where there is policy decisions, right. planning decisions. What I think self-driving can contribute can, can help solving many of the inefficiencies of the current system. One is intersection, the other is load balancing, as right. it, was saying, it was mentioning before. Mm. So, but if we, if we choose at a policy level to say, no vehicles in the central business district. I mean, we can make those policy choices yeah, sure. uh, if, yeah. if, we, if, we, if we choose. Absolutely. So I guess an important issue is convenience, um, right? So why the, the reason we all drive is because our public transportation system is not convenient enough. It's not uh, nice enough to ride. It's not, it doesn't take us to all the destinations yeah. where we want to go to. And so you could imagine taking on this issue and saying, well, can we make a more convenient public transportation system, and then can we, can we imagine that uh, much, of the, much of the travel will be by public transportation system, and then um, in neighborhoods there will be solutions provided by robots to solve the last mile problem. So you get to your main um, node, and then the robot waits for you there and takes you to your destination on your campus at work, at home, or um, in, the, uh, in the CBD. Right. So that would, be, uh, that would be a vision for the future, but that requires that we have something else um, that we can use, we can rely on, we can count on. Something tells me this conversation is going to run and run, but um, we must break for, well, the joy of having some conversation, a cup of coffee and a breath of fresh air. But I just want a one-liner. You had five minutes and you responded to that. One sentence. Take-home message into the coffee break. Driverless cars, what would your message to these wonderful people be? I'm going to start at this end. Daniela. Don't be afraid. They're coming. <laughs> <laughs> they're coming to get you? No, they're coming. Here we are. Yeah, that's my message. Don't be afraid. Okay. They're, they're here. Okay. I'm, I'm feeling reassured already. Yes. So think about be afraid. Okay. No, go on. So think about the efficiency of this kind of 
of transportation and the environmental benefits. Okay. I think they will solve more problems than they will produce. So there will be more solutions. Where have I heard that, that one before? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> business case. Business case for the autonomous vehicles deployment in cities or suburbs. Brilliant. Fascinating discussion. Thank you very much to our panel. <laughs>